Hi there, this is Matt Heffernan, and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be continuing a, a little bit of a series I've got going on. If you uh, saw the previous episode, I was doing a Hello World application on an Atari 2600. And if you haven't seen that, or the previous one I did about the Commander X16, please go back and subscribe to my channel and check out those videos and uh, maybe get a little context about uh, what I'm doing here. And so far it's been working out pretty well. So today I'm going to move a bit forward in time uh, from the 2600 into the uh, mid-80s and the Nintendo Entertainment System, also known as the NES, or in Japan where it came from, the Family Computer, or Famicom. And uh, we're going to see what it takes to do Hello World on a N Nintendo. And uh, uh, we know the 2600 was not easy, so maybe the NES is a, a little easier. Well, let, let's take a look. First, uh, let's uh, go a little deeper into the history of our friend the 6502 processor. So the Nintendo com came out in what I consider to be sort of the tail end of the golden age of the 6502, where... Uh, there was a lot of big success and, and a, a lot of you know great development happening around that processor. Uh, starting uh, from where we left off, uh, of course, back in '77, Atari released the VCS or 2600 game console, and uh, they very soon realized, uh, of course, the massive uh, profit potential from doing something like that, selling cartridges for game consoles. It was a a big untapped market that they immediately dominated. And uh, they decide that, well, they can do a better job and sort of get something a little more educational that maybe mom and dad don't want to buy a, uh, a uh, video game system that kids are just going to sit in front of a TV with a joystick and rot the brains out. So instead, they'll come up with some real microcomputers that you can do, like, programming and basic, and, and just, you know, it, it, it looks more educational because it's a, it's, it's a computer, right? So they came out with these two computers, the Atari 400 and 800. These are still uh, 6502-based microcomputers and uh, had more or less a lot of this, the similar uh, trappings on the inside, but the 800 was the, the fancier model. Instead of a membrane keyboard like the 400, it had a, a full-stroke keyboard and was more expandable and rugged and definitely... Uh, and definitely the the more popular uh, ultimately and what what spawned the the further series of atari 8-bit computers throughout the 80s and uh, the atari 400 was more geared towards kids uh, they it was really just supposed to be a game console sort of like a sequel console to the 2600 uh, and that it, it they almost didn't even put a keyboard on it so, but ultimately they did this membrane keyboard. It's like, oh, kids are going to spill Kool-Aid on it. So go ahead and make it easy to clean up. And uh, mainly people are still plugging in the same uh, Atari joysticks into them. And uh, But a new set of cartridges for a new set of games that are much more sophisticated. And because with these you have, a, you have actual character generators, you have real bitmap graphics, you have a, a lot of the, the sort of the hallmarks that we have since come to understand as the, the capabilities of a 6502 based system or any 8-bit system. And they were very popular and uh, came out uh, not at the price points they had hoped uh, of $400 and $800, thus their names. They uh, couldn't quite uh, get it within that price point, so they ended up uh, introducing them for $549 and uh, almost $1,000 for the 800 But those prices did come down over time, and, uh, and the, the base models became uh, you know, more fully featured, would come out with more RAM initially with 8K of RAM, and it eventually became standard for the, the 800 to ship with 32 or 48k of RAM, which was you know quite a lot uh, into the early 80s at this point that we're talking about. So uh, Atari what, had uh, two successful 8-bit platforms uh, alongside each other, uh, one with the uh, sort of uh, not exactly you know legitimate sheen of uh, educational. Uh, qualities to it, if you will, but it, it was still a, 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 a real microcomputer, and you could do, you know, real microcomputer stuff and have floppy disks and, and all that, and it was, uh, it was a very good and popular system for a while. Uh, then moving on into the 80s, the, the first big hit of the 6502 was the Commodore VIC-20, the, 
the SQL system sort of to the PET. Now, whereas the PET was more of a business-oriented machine, VIC-20 was aimed squarely at the home market. Now, it didn't have uh, much in the way of any sort of productivity potential. The, the text uh, resolution was very small. It had big blocky letters. You, you couldn't do like real word processing or spreadsheets or anything with that. That would be at all useful to a small business. But it provided a, a very easy way to get a microcomputer into the home at a very low price point of $299.95. Under $300 for a uh, color microcomputer which was really quite astounding and it had built-in basic in the ROM, and it it didn't have uh, bitmap graphics per se but the uh, unlike the pet where you were stuck with the petsky character set in the vic 20 uh, once it loaded that uh, petsky character set into ram you could go ahead and change that to well, whatever character set you wanted and then take advantage of the, the color capabilities to make something that kind of looks like bitmap graphics. And uh, in, in reality was a very simple tile based graphics with each tile just having two colors to it. But you had uh, you know, eight colors to choose from. It, it was, or rather, sorry, 16 colors to choose from. It was uh, a pretty good system, especially for that price, and ended up being extremely popular, and at one point was the most popular computer in the home market, or really any market, because uh, <laughs> that's what this is when homes really started buying computers, not just for uh, businesses. And uh, then across the pond in the UK, there was the BBC Micro that came out in 1981, and uh, this was an attempt by the BBC. Of course, they're a you know multimedia company now, but of course back then it was you know, TV and radio, and uh, they were very prescient and saw the potential for uh, microcomputers in the home and spe specifically in the schools to to get kids uh, and adults exposed to computing uh, in as a easy a way as possible and to, to use their uh, uh, ability with uh, radio and TV to help communicate the importance and the possibilities of computing to the British public. And they were able to get this uh, very capable, uh, definitely far more capable than the Apple II or the uh, Atari 800 and certainly the VIC-20, an extremely capable computer. And the, the basic uh, version was 235 pounds. For 335 pounds, you've got a, a 64K version of the of the computer, which was uh, astounding at that point. So talking in 1981 US dollars, that would be $652. So you know, much cheaper than the Atari 800 to be able to uh, get something that was much, much better. And uh, unfortunately, it never really caught on. There, there was an attempt to make an American uh, version of it, but it, it didn't really, didn't really go anywhere because the VIC-20 was really killing it at this point, and there was no other way they were going to get it down to that sub three hundred dollar uh, price point. Especially once in 1982, Commodore turned right around and put out the uh, Commodore 64. In fact, it, it's a bit of a misnomer here that VIC-20, it, it only came out in Japan in 1980. It was sort of mid-1981 by the time it hit the, the U.S. market. And, uh, and already by the end of 81, Commodore was like, well, we can do even better than this. And they came up with the Commodore 64 design and was light years ahead of the VIC-20. You had uh, real uh, bitmap graphics in there. You had uh, the the same ability to have uh, Petsky uh, tiles be replaced with uh, graphics tiles, but then you can have uh, uh, more colors in, involved. You can have uh, more more tiles on the screen, and you can have hardware-based sprites. Really, uh, extremely impressive, and of course. The, uh, the famous SID sound chip that uh, really had excellent sound. So what you had at that point was the very best platform for video gaming uh, within the North American market. And starting at $595, now of course that price didn't hold for very long because right after that uh, Commodore still kept selling the VIC-20 but in a much reduced rate. They eventually got the VIC-20 down to under $100, brand new retail. 
and then eventually the Commodore 64 settled in at that 300 and then lower price points going forward. So the Commodore 64 is still to this day the most popular computer system ever released in North America. So now uh, what we're getting into is the, the point in 1983 when in Japan Nintendo, a company that had only very recently gotten into video games, they had a, a few big hits in the uh, arcades such as uh, Donkey Kong, of course, is uh, the, the most famous example. And they had uh, done not a whole lot in gaming, never really considered home gaming, and uh, decided that, well, they could have sort of a home computer system. They could call it a computer. Uh, they called it the Family Computer or Famicom. And kind of like the Atari VCS, it was a computer, but not really. It was still 6502 based, but it had a, a graphics capability that was pretty darn close to what you were seeing in the arcades at the time, which uh, it was still maybe not up to the level of the uh, uh, Commodore 64, but definitely far, far superior to the uh, Atari 2600, which was still the dominant video game console at that time. However, if you know a bit more about the history, is that the uh, Atari 2600 had peaked shortly before this, and what was happening in North America and in Europe at that point was the great video game crash of that era, where the market had become flooded with Atari 2600 games of uh, generally very low quality. And so Atari had no means of being able to prevent anybody from putting out their own uh, Atari 2600 cartridges. They had no uh, sort of digital rights management or, or anything that would prevent anybody from just, well, sticking a ROM in a cartridge, uh, on a, in a PCB board and a cartridge, and slamming it into 2600 and have whatever crap you ever wanted to play on that uh, console. And uh, as a result, the, the North American and European markets uh, just had sort of given up on the home video game console. And so it was not a great time for them in Japan where they didn't really experience that. Because uh, what happened when this came out in 1983, it came out for mere 14,800 yen, which uh, the yen was pretty weak at that point, but that was only like $61. Uh, in U.S. dollars at that time. So it was an extremely affordable system and far more capable than uh, pretty much any low-cost uh, uh, any low-cost microcomputer system available in Japan at that time. And so they, they didn't have that. They had a whole new boom of for video games. Whereas in America, video games had started to more shift towards these uh, microcomputers, especially the Commodore 64, but also, of course, the uh, IBM PC and uh, other other popular computer systems of, of the time. And so it, it really took a while for uh, Nintendo to really get up the nerve and come up with a strategy to break the Famicom into the North American market. And so in 1985, they repackaged the Famicom as the Nintendo Entertainment System. And it came with a very, at that time, very sleek console. It had that, uh, that cartridge mechanism where you stick it in and push it down, and then it covers back up. It looks very much like a, a piece of home entertainment equipment, like a VCR or a CD player or something. That's exactly what they were going for. That's why it's not even a computer system or it's certainly not a video game system. It's an entertainment system. And what it came with initially was uh, ROB, the robot, to play one of the packing games called Gyromite, and a light gun to play the other packing game, which was Duck Hunt. And, of course, it had the controller, but it didn't actually come with like a traditional sort of video game. It had uh, the, the, the sort of novelty games that came with it. So th this was a home entertainment system. And... Yeah, as you probably have guessed, this was very successful, and it launched at only $179. So $20 cheaper than the 2600 had launched for with just a couple of joysticks and, uh, and no games, <laughs> right? So the Nintendo Entertainment System 
uh, really uh, went in with a bang. And then uh, a couple years later, 1987, they they ditched the robot and uh, from pretty much everything, and and then even the gun became optional. So you could just get the uh, Nintendo Entertainment System with controllers, just the regular gamepad controllers, and uh, and the packing game of Super Mario Brothers for less than a hundred dollars. And at that point, really, it really, really took off in, in North America. And so, well, now, now how are we going to deal with this now? Of course, all of these uh, previous systems before the Famicom and NES are, again, Hello World is going to be very similar to what I did for the Commander X-16. And uh, even if doing it with C, of course, would be, again, just another printf Hello World because they all have console support, uh, especially within CC65 makes it very simple and then even using the ca65 uh, assembler they had each their own sort of kernels and firmwares and things where you could just you know put uh, characters using their ascii or petsky codes to their uh, consoles and it was very trivial to do a hello world but here we go again to this more embedded platform of a video game console there's no keyboard and not really a character generator but we're in a better position than we are with the 2600 because now you're playing with power as nintendo had uh, told us back in 1985. so uh, what you get in sort of the base unit of the uh, nes is uh, uh, 2k of uh, general purpose cpu accessible ram you have 2k of uh, video ram uh, that is uh, addressed uh, separately by the uh, graphics system which we'll talk about later which also had access to an 8 kilobyte character ROM uh, directly to the graphic system. And then the actual program would be on the program ROM, which uh, would start at about 16K, but you could bank that and have uh, a whole lot more. And even more RAM and other things, you could expand the character ROM, even bank that. There is uh, a lot of flexibility because the NES turned over uh, a, a lot of the address space uh, for the CPU over to the cartridge so you could really build out within your cartridge all sorts of different hardware to expand these capabilities and uh, so but what you had within the system what you had to be able to feed it uh, with was the uh, the picture processing unit or PPU and that's what would have access to that onboard VRAM and then the character ROM which would be uh, made available, uh, be routable to the VRAM uh, from the cartridge. And of course, but then you could route that in a, uh, in a different way and bank that and have more character ROM. And within that character ROM, of course, our characters, uh, you don't have to have characters in there, but that is sort of, a, there's like an off the shelf font that I'm sure you're familiar with for Nintendo. Uh, but you could totally replace that and not even use all of those characters. And then you had um, other tiles, just pure graphic tiles, that could be with, within that character ROM. And then what the PPU would take that, those characters and be able to arrange them into these uh, four uh, 32 by 30 tile name tables. And I put four in quotes because it, you couldn't really do four. You didn't have the actual VRAM for four. And we'll, we'll talk about that more. So it was really just two of these name tables that were available and that you could do you know, two-dimensional scrolling between them. And uh, each, um, each tile or character with a, within each name table would be able to have its own uh, four-color uh, palette uh, defined, uh, selected rather, from four available uh, palettes, four t characters and tiles. And then the PPU also provided sprites. You could have 64 different sprites, and those sprites could be either 8x8 pixels or 8x16 pixels, where basically it would uh, use the same tile set that you're using for the background, but the 8x16 sprites would have to be contiguous tiles in that uh, ROM. And uh, it allowed you to have a DMA access to their attributes, and 
and then a, a, a four more palettes just for sprites and you could put the sprites in front of or behind the background and flip them around uh, vertically and horizontally a, you could really do a lot with the sprites on there and it was a, a very capable graphic system that was very inexpensive even for the time and for sound you had a pretty good sound too where you had these uh, four waveform generators so you'd have uh, two uh, voices that could have configurable uh, pulse waves uh, another triangle wave that you could play with, a noise generator where you can even adjust the frequency of the noise, and then a 7-bit, uh, very basic PCM that uh, was uh, mainly used for sort of uh, sampled effects that would go into those soundtracks. And uh, a lot of sound effects just, just to save on RAM, uh, ROM chips because ROM was very expensive that it uh they would generally use waveform generation for most sound effects but if they wanted to use the space they could use the uh, uh digitized samples to uh, play back some sound effects or drums or whatever so let's take a little closer look at the name tables because that's what we're going to be dealing with in order to do hello world we need to be able to get those character tiles onto the screen so uh, what you have are these four name tables that are in uh, both the uh, memory space uh, in VRAM and uh, sort of uh, arranged in this fashion as you scroll around. Uh, and so of course your zero, 00 point is up in that upper left corner with uh, name table A. And the, the way that it works, since you only have the actual 2K of uh, VRAM to work with, you have to do some sort of mirroring. You can't have uh, four unique name tables. So you can set up your cartridge to either mirror A and B with each other, uh, and then uh, uh, C and D would be different. So oh, that would be vertical mirroring, or you could do horizontal mirroring, where A and C are mirrors of each other, and B and D are mirrors of each other. And so you could still write to whichever part uh, the RAM is just like if you're right now and in the game that I'm going to show you, the quote unquote game, uh, it's vertically mirrored. So I'm going to be writing to name table A, but they, those uh, same tiles will also show up in name table B if I were to scroll down and see them. So uh, taking a closer look at one of those name tables. So each, each one is, uh, takes up uh, 32 by 30 tiles, which fills up the screen. So if you are uh, scrolled to the corner of oh, one of these name tables, you're only going to see that one name table at any given time. And uh, then of course you can go uh, scroll wherever you want within that space and see whatever you've uh, got placed in those different name tables. So within name table A, that starts at the VRAM address 2000 hex, and you have that first row, uh, and uh, you're just putting the actual uh, uh, tile index in there uh, and uh, in general a, a character tile set you're going to just have the ASCII values uh, be the indexes for those uh, character tiles which makes it pretty easy and in fact CC65 uh, gives you a sample character round to use where it's already aligned for that where it has all the ASCII characters in their uh, ASCII index positions and then a few like uh, a few extra like graphics or like drawing boxes and things uh, with those uh, with those character tiles and, and it works out pretty nice so you've got then 32 bytes for each row of uh, the name table and so you go through all 30 rows and each uh, of course each uh, each square within that name table can have a unique tile and because again you can have uh, 512 tiles available to you, uh, although it's uh, generally you're banking between these two 256 tile sets, and so, but you could change, uh, again, just like the 2600, uh, with timing so that your uh, upper half uh, is using one bank, say it's using characters up at the top, and then using graphics down at the bottom for the background, which uh, right in Super Mario Brothers it's doing just that, where in like that top row or two or three rows rather it's using uh, it's using numbers and uh, other characters and then tiles below that 
so you can you can change up which bank of uh, of these uh, things from the pattern tables that you're using. That's what the uh, actual characters and tiles are called. And then uh, at, after that uh, row 29, so yeah, all 30 rows in there of all those pattern indices, then you have the uh, attribute table uh, for that name table. And uh, for each eight bytes of that, it represents two rows of those tiles uh, and gives you two bytes effectively for uh, each tile with, within that those two rows uh, over those eight bytes. And that allows you to select which palette. So it's only four different palettes to choose from, so you only need two bytes. And then that works out. So then you have just that last 64 bytes of the name table helps you set the a, a unique palette for for each of those uh, each of those tiles. And that's that's it. That's that's all there really is to putting the background graphics. And we're not going to get into the sprites just like with the Hello 2600. We're just setting up our text in the background. So let's take a look at what that actual code is. So here is the uh, assembly file, and we're just going to be compiling this. Now, I'm, you can see here I'm inlining all the code. I'm including uh, more assembly code within here because I have some, some boilerplate that, that needs to go in there. And so that here, if you look at my build script, I am just calling CL65. I'm using the NES type as opposed to the, other, the 20, Atari 2600 or CX16 types that you've seen in the other videos. And uh, then just putting out this hello.nes uh, ROM file. And that ROM file, it actually has, uh, it's a special format called INES, where it has both the character ROM and the program ROM uh, arranged together, and then a few other settings specified to help sort of uh, emulate what the uh, different hardware settings and mappings could be uh, within an actual Nintendo cartridge. And of course, I get a nice assembly listing and then just pass in that one assembly source file. So we can see here at the very top, I'm including a couple of uh, files that I created. Uh, <coughs> of course, I didn't create them from whole cloth. They were sort of borrowed and modified and to uh, suit my very own nefarious purposes. So I have all of the different um, uh, PPU registers and APU, which is the uh, audio. Uh, chip and uh, I'm not going to get into that but I, I did create one for that so here we can look at the registers for the PPU and uh, you can see there, there's not a lot uh, right in there that the uh, uh, PPU has uh, one two three four five six seven eight and <laughs> that's it and then this uh, 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 DMA uh, area and and that's uh, sort of how, how, we, uh, how we deal with stripes. So we're not going to look into that. Mainly we're going to be looking at these, uh, these eight registers. And that's generally how you communicate with the, uh, with the PPU. And then I also have in here some like um, different codes for the colors. You can see here there are basically 16, uh, or not quite 16, it's really... Uh, 13 different colors and then you can have shades apply to them uh, sort of dark neutral light and very light and, and we'll we'll see how that works later on and then some important uh, VRM addresses like hey where's name table a and then within that attribute table a and then where are the palettes uh, the palettes are off in the uh, uh, 3f area of uh, VRAM which is sort of a special area of VRM that's not part of that 2k of VRAM and they are sort of special addresses within that. And just like the pattern table uh, are also special addresses and even though they're in ROM and not really VRAM but they are part of the uh, memory map of the PPU and they get uh, <coughs> referenced directly. So uh, what you have to do for uh, CC65 is you sort of have to start it with the header and so you've got to call out the header segment and then you have to put in these bytes uh, for the header to let it know yep this is an NES ROM and say well how many uh, 
how many banks of uh, program ROM? We're saying there's two 16K, although I don't really need that for this. I can get away with one. Uh, and then uh, one, uh, one 8K uh, character bank. And, and of course, that, that 8K character bank gives you 512 different characters or tiles. Uh, so they're, there's really, they're really banked also within that. They're sort of like 4K sub banks. And, uh, and then we're here specifying mirroring. So here I'm doing that vertical mirroring, like I told you. And then saying uh, what mapper I'm using. And uh, I'm not using any special mapper, but that those mappers would uh, help you uh, sort of to, uh, if you wanted to have uh, something other than just vanilla 16K banks, uh, there were different mapping chips that you could put in the cartridges. And those would tell you how to manage your memory and how you would sort of access that larger ROM space. So going back here, uh, the next thing I included was this NES Care, and that's another uh, sort of required uh, segment that you need to have, which is the CARES segment or the pattern tables. And here we're going to see the how, how the actual pattern table gets structured. So here this is the, the t this is effectively the the top of the PPU address space and the first character of course is all uh, all zeros it's just a transparent tile which is and what's actually going to be most of the screen in most applications is we're going to have a, uh, a transparent tile for uh, a lot of games where you don't want to have anything right there and so but you can see here there are uh, you have eight bytes, which would look like hey, that's a that's a, a you know one bit bitmap for an eight by eight character. So in order to have a a, a two bit bitmap, what it does is rather than have uh, two bits uh, next row, so that you'd have sort of each each row being sixteen bits, it splits that up so that you sort of have the upper bit and the lower bit. And that's uh, what we get here. So we have the ultimately 16 bytes for that uh, for each character. Now here in the character ROM, I have uh, one set in the same place for both the upper and lower bits, so that effectively it's going to be color index three for the palette that gets used for each of these character ROMs. And you can see here that these uh, sort of the middle two. Uh, the sort of interior nibble, if you will, of the address is the index for, uh, of that pattern in the pattern table that you actually put into the at, into that um, name table. And then here, once we get up to uh, 20 hex here, which is at 200, here we see again an empty one because that's the space. And now we start getting into the uh, visible ASCII characters, exclamation point. Here you see exclamation point twice double quotes twice, hash twice, dollar sign twice, and so on. And that's, uh, that's uh, how, how we're able to very easily just put uh, within our source code uh, ASCII characters and uh, have that relate to those tiles, just, just as we would with, within a, uh, let's say, an X16 game, uh, or really more specifically an XCI game. If you go back and see my XCI videos, I make sure and have all these characters mapped to their proper ASCII values. So going back here, now we have a couple of more required segments that you have to have in your code, the startup and code. And here I just sort of slam them together because uh, here I'm having my uh, start vector also be in the code segment. And here's where I jump to the, uh, this start address down here. And also, like uh, if you remember in the Hello 2600, uh, at the very end you, you have to have the uh, same uh, three vectors at the very end of your ROM space. And so we have uh, this uh, VBlank uh, NMI uh, interrupt, so uh, you can enable this interrupt to happen uh, once per VBlank. And then you have sort of the start uh, that start address can be uh, fed to reset so when it resets it just goes right to that start and then uh, IRQ the, what the general uh, thing to do for an IRQ is to just 
return from. We're not supporting anything other than NMI interrupt. So anyway, but we're not even going to look into too much of how the NMI interrupt works because here we're, we're not even enabling it. We're just going in and creating our own code. So first we need to create a, a zero terminated string for our hello world, which we do right here. And uh, then I set up the default uh, mask for the, the PPU in terms of what I enabled. I just want background. I don't even want sprites to show up. So I've got this setting this bit here for the PPU mask will enable the background. And, and then I just create some more constants here saying, all right, I'm going to place my text uh, in uh, you know, column 9, row 14. And then I here uh, calculate uh, the, uh, the name table start. Oh, I should have used my uh, name table address here. Oh, well, caught that too late. <laughs> so I could, I could totally just change that right now here to uh, name table A. Because it's the same thing, right? It's 2000 hex. There it is. And, uh, and then I created a macro called wait v blank. And here it's just checking the upper bit of uh, the PPU status. And so by doing bit and then BPL, uh, that BPL will branch if the uh, upper bit of whatever memory address you're pointing at with bit was uh, zero, then it's like, or it's a positive number, it's a plus number. So we'll go back and we're going to wait until we see that that top bit of the PPU status register set. And then once that is, then we know the uh, V blank is, uh, is started and we can go and uh, start doing some code. So here at that start address, do some more housekeeping here where I uh, disable interrupts and then I uh, sort of clear out the status register and and then set up some uh, uh, disable more interrupts here. I'm disabling the APU, uh, so I don't want any sound interrupts happening. I uh, want to make sure my uh, stack pointer is uh, initialized. And it's not really FF, it's going to be 1FF, the way that it's going to work within, uh, within memory. And so you do have access in the NES to the, the full zero page for whatever you want, and then the rest of RAM starting at uh, 200 hex, uh, all the way up to 800 hex, uh, which is the, uh, the end of RAM. As you can see here also, I am uh, uh, initializing the, uh, with zero here by taking FF and incrementing it. Uh, to get zero again, to zero out the control and mask registers of the PPU, and then of course also the control for the APU. And then I do my first uh, vBlank wait, because what once I, I reset those registers, I need to wait for two frames to go by for the, the PPU to settle down and be ready to, to work with. So in between those, so you do a wait vBlank, then another one. In between those, uh, those first two uh, vBlanks, I go ahead and it's another just good practice to clear out RAM. Now, like in my 2600 video, I'm not actually using any RAM. Uh, I'm using zero RAM <laughs> for this, uh, unless you count video RAM. Uh, I am just, I'm not using any of the CPU RAM in here. Everything is in ROM because it's only going to print out Hello World. It doesn't need to have any RAM. You can do everything you need to do with registers. So. Here, after that second view blank, now PPU is settled down, nice steady state, and I can start making some uh, changes in uh, VRAM. So I, I start by setting my palette, and I uh, start here uh, with uh, the background color, and that's the, the first byte within that palette area of VRAM. And what I'm going to do is make the background color black, and then I'm going to set up uh, palette zero, that tile palette zero, to have its uh, zero color also be black, and then have three shades of red for the other three colors in that palette. And uh, as we saw before in that pattern table, 
since uh, all of the pixels for each of those character tiles is going to be three, they're going to come out as a light shade of red. Now I could always go in and I could switch these if I want a neutral red, or I could zero out every other uh, pattern table entry so that everything comes out as twos instead of threes. You know, however you wanted to do it, you can set it up that way. So now uh, I finally get to the point where I can put Hello World into VRAM so that at the next frame, it will actually show up. So uh, what I need to do is uh, go to that starting address that I had calculated before at compile time. And I put that into this address. Now, if you notice here, this PPU address register, it, it's kind of funny that you don't have, say like on the X16, when you're accessing VRAM, you have different registers for so the high and low bytes of the address. Well, here you just have the one, uh, one register, so you just write to it twice each time. So the first time you write to it, in its sort of default state, you're writing actually the high byte, and then you're writing the low byte of the address the second time. And then, uh, also like the X16, the uh, data uh, register, it has a uh, stride built in. And uh, unlike the X16, though, you don't have a lot of configuration options. <clears throat> Your stride is either going to be 1 or 32. And this makes sense because a, a stride of 1 will effectively write a row of tiles out. And a, a stride of uh, 32 would put in a column of tiles because you've got 32 tiles wide. So you, incre you increment that uh, sort of address by 32, you're going to be directly beneath the tile that you had just put in a, uh, a pattern index for. So here I uh, just do a very simple loop. I go through that hello string and just one character at a time. I put that uh, ASCII character code. Uh, into PPU data, and and then eventually once I once I hit the uh, null terminator, uh, I will get a zero out of this load of hello string with the X offset, and that's when I will go to set pal. And here now at the at the bottom of that name table, I am uh, just going to zero out the entire attribute table so that. Uh, no matter where I put uh, tiles within name table A, that they are going to use that palette zero that I created, because it's the only palette I defined. <coughs> and I only need to have a few tiles in there anyway, but just to be nice and safe, reset everything to palette zero. Uh, so that then, you know, I could very easily change my position up here with this macro calculation and it will still come out the same color. And then finally, once I've uh, got the VRAM all set, then I have to uh, set in the PPU the scroll registers. And again, like the address register, it, it sort of goes back and forth in terms of uh, what you're actually setting. So the first time you write to it, you're setting the X value of the, of the scroll position. And the second time you write to it, it's the Y value. And here I'm just setting it to uh, z the position 0, 0. So the, uh, you're getting the, uh, the upper right corner of the display will be uh, exactly at the upper right corner of name table A. And then finally, I enable the display by using this uh, constant version of the default mask on PPU mask, where, as you recall, I had enabled the uh, background tiles, but not sprites or anything else. And then I can enter the game loop, where now that I've done what I want to do, I don't have anything else really to do, but I can go in there and within the main loop, Rather than depending on doing stuff within, say, an NMI interrupt uh, service routine, I can just do a this wait v blank, and then each uh, each frame that comes along, the uh, every uh, it's a of course a, and we're dealing here with NTSC because it's Japan and later North America. Every uh, uh, so 30 times a second, I'm able to go in there, and a new v blank starts, and I'm able to. Uh, make some changes into what you're going to see in the screen uh, for the next frame. And then that's it. But of course, you're not gonna, I'm not going to change anything. I'm just going to leave the hello world up. So 
now that we've gone through all that code, let's go ahead and build it. So you can see here, the what you get is that build script right there. I can call the build script, or like I said, you could just uh, do that CL65 command, and then you can see here it created this hello.nes file. And I've got my FCEUX uh, Famicom NES emulator all, all set and ready to go. And I will just go ahead and say, yep, give me that hello.nes, which I've opened before, as you could probably guess. And, oh, it goes right back to small. So if I blow this up, there it is, hello world. And I've sort of placed it right in the middle of the screen. And what's nice about FCEUX, uh, if you're going to develop your own NES game, that it has a built-in debugger. So you can see here, um, a fully featured debugger. You can go into anywhere within the CPU RAM space, uh, or not just CPU, but whole CPU memory space to uh, examine that. And then you can look in the PPU viewer. So uh, the PPU viewer doesn't show you everything in PPU. It really just shows you the pattern tables. And here we can see that uh, character ROM that we had to find. And if you were to uh, just sort of add below that, uh, you could right here within that Nescare ASM, you could just keep going and define an, up to uh, 256 more. And, uh, and that would fill out your, your full bank of, uh, your full 8K bank of addresses. Oops. And, uh, and have uh, all sorts of graphics and which you use for tiles or sprites whatever you want to use and here it even uh, visualizes your palette so there's that one palette I, I'm not sure why the uh, dark red doesn't show up on there but uh, <laughs> I can't vouch for this uh, entirely and then uh, the other oh, let me go back over here and another helpful debugger is the name table viewer and here we can see that vertical uh, mirroring happening. And it also shows you where, and it's kind of hard to see here, but you've got these white lines up here and up here showing you the uh, current scroll position. And uh, if I disabled them, you could kind of see them go away. And if you did scroll over to here, you'd be able to, to, to see that and see what you would actually expect to see on screen and then sort of inspect here you can see the uh, tile IDs those ASCII character codes as I sort of move my mouse along there I can see each of those placed in that address and then you can see here the even though I only poked them into these addresses they do get mirrored in these uh, later addresses for name table C and that's basically it so if you like this and you like the, the previous videos I, I did on there uh, go ahead and uh, you know subscribe to my channel uh, like the video you got these nice likes and of course the bell here to get the notifications and uh, I, I hope to see you again here real soon and uh, if you like this video uh, please go ahead and put a comment down below and uh, maybe give me an idea of uh, what I should do next because uh, I'm going to start running out of uh, 6502 systems. I may have to branch out into some other things, but I, I think this uh, takes us through the uh, evolution of the 6502 and how it was used for uh, different systems over time. And uh, anyway, I uh, thank you. I hope you uh, go out and create some awesome stuff, and I'll talk to you again later. Bye-bye.